Praise the Lord. I started off with this verse, and I want to uh, just read it again. If you have your Bibles with me, if you turn to Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, and I'm, I'm going to dismiss the children at this time as well. I thank God for our Sunday school teachers. I thank God for opportunity to hear the word of God, to come into his house and to take in the word of God. Praise the Lord. Hebrews 10, 24. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. I like what the King James Version says. It says, provoking one another. Provoking sounds like a fairly, a much stronger word than stirring up. But to provoke one another to love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. The day of the Lord. As we see the day of the Lord approaching, that there would be a stirring up of love, love for one another. That there would be a, a stirring up or a provoking to good works. And sometimes that provoking means taking, uh, getting in somebody's face, if you would, and uh, as you as you would i'm sure mom's looking for him <laughs> assembling and assembling together and uh you are here this morning little john is here this morning that's great he's in the house of the lord Praise God. And to exhort one another. Exhort means to instruct. It means to uh, speak into somebody's life. It might be encouragement. It might be direction. It might be uh, a, a comforting. It might be uh, a rebuking in love. As we see the day of the Lord approaching. I, I, I could spend a lot of time uh, just giving you signs of, of the, the return of the Lord. Uh, we can see that at this point in time. We can see that the, the Lord is coming back soon. The things that are going on, and uh, one of the things that I recognize as the day of the Lord is approaching, it is approaching, it is getting nearer every day. And as I look at prophecy, as I see and read prophecy, and one-third of the, the word is prophetic, as in foretelling what is to come and giving instruction regarding what is coming. And, and sometimes there's a thing of, of, of rebuke and correction and to say, hey, get back on track. But there's warning there's always warning. Before judgment comes, there's always warning. And judgment begins in the house of the Lord. In 1 Peter 4, verse 17, it's, it says that judgment begins in the house of the Lord. Where will the godless be? If judgment begins with the, within the house of the Lord, with the righteous, where will the godless be? And so, I thank God for the warning that he gives. And I just want to mention one thing. Uh, May 17th, 1948, Israel became a nation. In one day, it became a nation. And the, that very day, there was an attack on the, this small state. But there's passage that says, this generation will not pass away until all these things come to pass. How long is a generation? It says that we, should, we would live three score ten years. A score is twenty. 
three score, three times 20 is 60. Three score 10 is 70. I'll tell you right now, we are past 70 years. So, yeah, it can go even, hey, anything past 70 years is a bonus. The Lord is coming back soon. You don't have a nation that's been, not been in existence for 2,000 years suddenly become a nation in one day. You don't have a group of people that have been scattered around the globe in different countries become a nation in one day, having kept their culture and having kept their ethnicity over 2,000 years. AD 70, the Jews were decimated. They had been surrounded and there was battle taken going on and the general, the Roman general Titus uh, basically rampage, broke through in the rampage and there was about a million people that died after the general and his forces went in. It was brutal, brutal battle. They were fighting for their lives. A million people died in AD 70. Jesus foretold, this is not one stone will remain left standing of the temple. Not one stone. And to this day, the temple, there's not one stone of the temple that has been left standing. There's a foundation, but none of the, nothing of, of the temple is there. The Lord is coming back soon. And so there's instruction. It says, let me read again, and let us consider one another in order to stir up or provoke one another to love and good works. We love one another, provoke one another to, to good works, that we would assemble together, that we would exhort one another as we see the day of the Lord approaching. This morning, I want to exhort you with the word of God. I want to exhort you. So this thing of loving your neighbor, if we can just turn to uh, Romans chapter 13. So I'm going to be ch checking into a few uh, different passages but regarding loving your neighbor, it says in verse 8, Romans 13, verse 8, Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, and now Paul, by the Spirit of God, starts to, to list off some of the ten commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. To love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So the entire law can be summed up with, as Jesus said, hey, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. To love your neighbor as yourself you might ask, well, who's my, my neighbor? My neighbor is my brother and sister in the Lord, whether you know them well or not. So we love our brother and sister in the Lord, whether we know them well or not. Even as you would come and gather t together, I want to exhort you, I want to provoke you to love your neighbor, to go out of your way to spend time with each other, to go out of your way. It says, as the day of the Lord approaches, not to say, well, you know what? I cannot gather together with others. I'm going to gather with, together with others. We've had major restrictions in the last few years. There's an opening at this point in time, for goodness sake, that we would take the time that we have to enjoy fellowshipping with one another. Whether it's one-on-one, -on -one. maybe it's a matter of going out, spending time with a neighbor, a brother and sister in the Lord. Maybe it's somebody that's not doing well uh, or struggling in their faith, in their walk, to connect with them, to encourage them, to say, hey, listen, I, I, I love you, I'm praying for you, and to pray for them, to love your neighbor. Your neighbor can be 
the unbeliever that the Lord puts in your path. Maybe it is a family member. Maybe it is a geographical neighbor as in, hey, they live right beside you. Or they live a few doors down. Or they live across the street from you. That I would love my neighbor. Hallelujah. The stranger can be the stranger that you connect with or you come across can be your neighbor. So as the day approaches that you would love your neighbor, knowing this, it says in Romans 13, verse 11, it says, and do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than we first believed. When did you give your life to the Lord? How long has it been since you gave your life to the Lord? And I can remember, I can remember, this was at Bethel Camp, just about half an hour, 40 minutes past London. And I can remember a message. This was probably in the, the 70s and the 80s. And they still had the services. I can remember that service, that Sunday service night. And it, and it was in German. In fact, the speaker that, that was speaking was, was from Germany. It was, the message was in Germany. And I can remember back then already, there, was a, there, was a, there were tongues and interpretation given in the message in the, or during the service. And I can remember when the interpretation came, and I was a teenager at the time, and the speaker said in German that the coming of the Lord is so, so near. Zo, zo, na, for those that speak German. It is so, so near, the coming of the Lord. That was in the 70s. How much nearer is the return of the Lord? We say, well, maybe there's another uh, 20, 30, 40 years left before the Lord returns. It says here, let me read again. So regarding loving your neighbor, and do this, this is Romans 13, 11, and do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. When you're sleeping, you're not doing anything. You're, you're, you're unaware. Listen, we cannot be sleeping as the day of the Lord is approaching. We cannot be unaware. We cannot be doing nothing. When you're sleeping, you're not doing too much. And the word of God here is, is there's an illustration of the, of the fact that there are people that are sleeping. In other words, they're not doing anything. Paul is not talking to the unbeliever. He is talking to the church and to the believers in Rome. And he is saying, get out of your sleep. Get out of doing nothing. I, listen, I recognize we got to work. And so we work every week, whatever amount of time that you are working. But I'll tell you, when you're finished work, there is time. And even at work, the interactions that we can have with those that we, the Lord has put us with, that we would work as unto the Lord and that we would take the opportunities as they arise because the Lord has connected us and put us with those people, those unbelievers, and that we would not be sleeping, but that we would it'd be high time. I like that. Now it is high time to start to do something before the Lord comes. And it is about loving your neighbor, your brother and sister in the Lord, and taking the time. You know, I, I, just, I just loved this past Wednesday night. So there was a whole range of guys from young, young men to some of us older guys. And after the service, we got together. Uh, some of the, the ladies, young ladies said, we're, 
we're not going to crash this time. But I, apparently they were, some of them were waiting in the parking lot after. I heard. I saw. But there, were, there was 16 guys out on Wednesday night to fellowship together after service. And so we had, we had a great time of, of breaking bread together and French fries and maybe some ordered, I don't know, mashed potatoes with gravy. But there was a time of fellowship. Listen, I know how busy I can be. And there's a time, it's high time that I wake up from the busyness of my life outside of some of the work that I do as a, even as a pastor and some of the free time that I have to say, you know what? I need to make even more effort to connect with my neighbor, my brother and sister in the Lord. There was a connecting. There was a, there was a laughing. There was just a, 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 a at times, kibitzing. There was, a, there was a, a back and forth as we sat at the table and the tables. It is important that we wake up as the Lord's return is near. For now our salvation, or basically the coming of the Lord, is nearer than we first believed, when we first believed. And I think back to that message that was given, that tongues and interpretation that was given back in the 70s, that the return of the Lord was so near. So, so near. It was over or 50, 50 plus years ago. The coming of the Lord is nearer than we first believed. The night, now the day of the Lord, think of it, and it hit me. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. To think that, you know what, we've been going through this time of darkness, but at the coming of the Lord, it is the day of the Lord. And here, I, I like what it's saying. The night is far spent, and even as we would be asleep, we, sh we need to wake up because his return is near. And the, 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 the coming of the Lord, and sometimes it's, it's darkest just before the light shines and the, the, the dawn comes and the sun begins to, to peek up over the horizon the night is far spent, the day is at hand. And then there's, there's some interesting things said here. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. I guess some of it could refer to the fact that, hey, if we're not doing anything because we're sleeping, we're waking up. It's time to wake up, folks. It's time to wake up. It's time to do a work as we see the day approaching the day of the Lord approaching therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light we're gonna get dressed let us walk properly as in the day and the things of night and and if there is anything of night being done in our lives that needs to be put off not in revelry and drunkenness not in lewdness and in lust, not in strife and in envy. Like we're talking some pretty serious things that, that Paul is saying these things should not be a part of the, the body of Christ, should not be part of the church. That should not be part of our lives. And if these things are a part, it says cast off these works of darkness. This is not of light. Get rid of the things of sin and the practice of sin in your life. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. I just want to say at this point, the works of darkness are the things of this world, they're the things of this flesh, they're the things of the enemy. And the enemy would want us to, to walk according to our flesh. It says here, making no provision for the flesh. What is the flesh? The flesh is our old man. It is our nature without Christ. It is also who <clears throat> our, our, our actions, the things that we would say and do, the things that are of the mind, that are carnal, that are of the flesh. 
The Lord is saying these things have to be cast off, making no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. I'm going to just read through this very quickly. I've read this passage numerous times in the last few years. I say, oh, Pastor Dave, again, just quickly. I say then, walk in the Spirit, in the Holy Spirit, in the power of the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, of what's in you, the, the cravings, the things that you're tempted by. Some of the things that you're tempted by, I'm not. And some things that I might be tempted by, you're not. But it's the flesh. It's coming to our flesh to say, hey, what are you going to do? The flesh says, I crave for those things. I want to do those things. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. So the things that we know we shouldn't do, we may do. And vice versa, the things that we shouldn't do, we do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now, gives a, the list, a, a list. Now, the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, sex outside of marriage, fornication, sex before marriage, uncleanness, and lewdness, also sexual things. To be unclean is, is the things of perversion and sexually unclean and lewd, perverted. Idolatry, having other gods before God. Sorcery has to do with witchcraft, also has to do, listen, let me expand on this, is the word pharmakeia, which has to do with pharmacy, which has to do with drugs. And I also want to say this. I'm talking about prescribed medications that are nar narcotics. I'm not talking about good medication. I'm talking about medications that, that, that some of you may be on for whatever reason. I have to have this. Hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. He is not talking to the unbeliever here. He is talking to the churches in the province of Galatia. He is talking to the church. And he's saying, this, these are the things of the flesh. You let your flesh have control. These are the things that will come to pass. And it says, and the like. You might say, man, it's a good thing. None of those things listed are what I, I might be caught up into. Praise God. And I say, praise God. But it says, and the like. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in times past, those, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Listen. You practice these things. It's like, no problem. I can go ahead and continue to do these things. You will not make it when the trumpet sounds. You will not inherit the kingdom of God if you're practicing these things. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit, in the Holy Spirit. Let us not be conceited. Oh, I can do it by myself. Provoking one another even as I'm doing it in my own strength, my own, I'm going to provoke others and I'm going to envy one another or envy others. If I do things in my own strength, in my own flesh, we need the Spirit of God in our lives and there's things that we need to get rid of. So, let me read again. And do, and do this, love your neighbor, knowing the time that now it is, or that now it is high time to wake out of the sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. In other words, the day of the Lord is coming. The day of the Lord is coming. The night, the, the time of, of night is almost finished. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off any works or the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and, revelry and darkness, not in lewdness and in lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust, to put on Jesus Christ. Listen, in my own strength and effort, I can't do it. So I put on Jesus. I like what it says here, to put on the armor of light. 
the armor of light to put on, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Just quickly, in Ephesians 6, verse 10, it talks about the battle that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood and talks about being strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And it talks about putting on the whole armor of God that we may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. We are living in, in evil days in the last days. But I want you to know that Jesus is coming soon. Praise God. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. How do I put on Jesus? It's recognizing who Jesus is, and by faith we put him on. It says, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the truth. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. If you read through Romans chapters 3 and chapter 4, it is about the righteousness of Jesus Christ. His righteousness is... We are clothed with robes of righteousness, this breastplate of righteousness. It is an armor to us. Jesus is our righteousness. Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, having this heart, I'm going to share the gospel of peace with others. What is it? What are we talking about here? We're talking about the fact that we have peace with God. We are in right standing with God. Jesus, he is our peace. He is the Prince of Peace. And so we, ha we are, even as we have peace about us, and we have the Prince of Peace, it says in Isaiah 9, verse 6, it says, for unto us a child is born. And, just, and I, I just find this amazing that this was written like 700 years before Jesus came. It says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace. I thank God at this point we have peace. And even as we have peace, that that peace would be shared with those that you love, your neighbor, your, your close relative, your distant relative, the person that might be the stranger, that the peace that we have would be shared with others. There is this aspect of having our feet shod or having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace so that wherever you walk, wherever you are, man, the peace that I have that the, the person that doesn't have that peace would have or have an opportunity to grab a hold of that peace. In these days, people are, are, are getting frantic. I, 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 see, I can see it. I can hear it. Price is going up. And there's, an, an, there's a, 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 an anxiety and a fear that is creeping into the hearts of people as they look and say, well, how am I going to make it? And to be able to say, how, you know what? We have peace. I have peace in Jesus Christ. The Prince of Peace. He is the Prince of Peace. Hallelujah. I don't have to worry. No matter what storm may come no matter what i may go through or what we may go through we have jesus christ the prince of peace with us so it says that we should put on our on our feet that they would be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace above all taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one the shield of faith. I was determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified, as Paul writes to the Corinthians. The Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, to the religious, a stumbling block, and to the Greeks and the intellectuals, this is foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, whatever way, as you grab a hold of it, Christ becomes the power of God and the wisdom of God to us. The power and wisdom of God to us in these days, in these dark days, even as it might be the darkest at this point, but the day is coming. The day of the Lord is approaching and the Lord will keep us because His foolishness the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. 
And because the foolishness of God, it says in 1 Corinthians 1, 25, it says the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So I put on Jesus Christ. I put him on and above all, taking the shield of faith and Jesus Christ and him crucified with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. I've seen that with people going through extreme situations. And there's nothing else that they can do to either, they can either trust the Lord in the Lord Jesus Christ and him crucified or not. They have a choice. And as they grab a hold, they draw near to the Lord. And as they grab a hold of the Lord, it's like, it doesn't matter what I'm going through. I will get through this. I've been spending time with our brother, Ron. Ron Frisky, who's been in the hospital for six or seven weeks now, eight weeks almost, and has had his, his foot amputated. You know what? I find as he is drawing closer and closer to the Lord, that a situation, I don't know about you, but that's pretty extreme. That's pretty extreme. He is drawing closer and closer to the Lord. I do not see a defeated man. I see a man that is, he cannot wait. He says, I've done more in the last three weeks than I've done in my entire life. In the hospital, ministering to others. Praise God. I just say, thank you, Lord, as we take the shield of faith and the shield of faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross 2,000 years ago quenches every fiery dart of the wicked one. Every single one. For goodness sake, when the enemy is shooting at you, do not put down your shield. Keep your shield up. My faith is in Jesus Christ and him crucified and nothing else. You will see me through. You will see us through. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in this flesh, in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We're talking at the cross. He gave himself, so my faith is in the one, in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And I do not set aside the grace of God. Listen, when we stop believing there, we set aside the grace of God. Grace, the grace of God is favor that we don't even deserve. And the Lord says, I want to give it to you because you faith the father wants to give it because your our faith is in his precious son that he willingly gave for us he wants to shower us with grace things that are undeserved i do not set aside the grace of god for if righteousness comes through the law then christ died in vain if i'm going to try to be a good person in my own strength i will not make it if i'm going to try to do things by myself with my own willpower, my own determination, my own list of, of different disciplines. I got to do this, 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 and this. No, no, no. You do some of those spiritual disciplines, you do. But keep your faith. Let your faith in Christ and Him crucified be the foundation. So we put on Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm talking about putting on Jesus Christ. It is by faith. Let me read it again. The life which I now live in this body... In this flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Faith in the Son of God. Above all, taking the shield of faith, especially when the fiery darts are flying. In the he Ephesians 6, 17, it says, And take the helmet of salvation. Jesus is our salvation. Covering our head, our mind, our thoughts, our thinking, where all the decisions are being made. There's a covering of those things as our faith is in Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life to be saved, to have eternal life. And so we, as our faith is in Christ, the helmet of salvation is put on. We are saved. 
and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. John 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In verse 14 it says, And we beheld him. He, he came in the flesh. He was in the flesh, and we beheld him full of grace and truth. He came in the flesh. Jesus is the Word of God. And even as we take in the word of God, even as you hear this morning, as you stand on the word of God and you move forward according to the word of God, you will be moving against the enemy in victory. That it's not just a defensive position, but you are moving forward by the sword of the spirit. His word. Hallelujah. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching to love others, to do those good works that we need to do to assemble together. This morning you are here. We are assembling together. Take time to, to get together and exhort one another. Don't, you know what? Not to do it in the thing of judgment if you see somebody struggling or whatever, but to to take them aside. It says, love covers a multitude of sin. But we can go and we can take somebody aside, a, a brother or a sister in the Lord, and just say, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm seeing things. Or you're struggling or you've, you've fallen. To, to lift them up. You know what? I have, we've ha we've ha we have people and we have brothers and sisters that we, we slip and we fall, that we would reach out and lift them up. One of the things when we slip and fall, and especially when we slip and fall more, more, more grievously, grievously, we feel, oh, my relationship with God isn't right. But that there would be, in a, in a spirit of gentleness, that we would restore them back to relationship with God just to let them know, hey, listen, you know what? As we humble ourselves before the Lord, he will lift us up. He lifts us up. As we confess our, our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that we can bring and restore a brother or sister in the Lord in their walk before him. Oftentimes, I mentioned this before, you know, when I, I can remember when I slipped or felt, sometimes it would be days and weeks before I got back in track spiritually because I, I was... I didn't think, well, God, you know what? Here I am again. The enemy was condemning, would condemn. And he's, you know what? You call yourself a Christian. To be restored to relationship. The heart of God is restoration, to, uh, to have relationship, to desire or to draw near to him. And oftentimes when we are in sin or practicing sin or have fallen in sin, drawing near to him seems very difficult, especially as the enemy is, is keeping us in condemnation. In Hebrews 10 verse 19 it says, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. It is by the blood. In fact, it is the blood. We need to recognize it is the blood of Jesus that washes us clean and cleanses us. And so we can have boldness to come into his pres presence by the blood, his shed blood for us. And so we enter in. In fact, the Lord would desire us to enter in. You know, it's, so often it seems like, Lord, I'm, I got too much much stuff going on. I, I I don't have time for you. I don't have time for the Lord. And the Lord the Lord's heart is just saying, "Hey, I want you. I want you to come in. I want you to be in my presence. I want to have relationship. I want fellowship with you. And we're just too busy, or we're too caught up, or we're maybe we're in that place of condemnation. Well, I don't think Jesus wants to see us. But we come in and we enter into the holiest." By the blood of Jesus. If you read through Hebrews, there's reference again and again to the Old Testament and the Old Tabernacle and the, and the sacrifices and all of that. And you need to recognize that there is only one person that could come into the presence of God directly, one time, 
each year, on one day each year. And that was the high priest. And there was this veil that held him back and held everybody else back. And this was a serious thing. Because we're talking about the sons of Aaron even bringing fire from a different, from a, not from the altar, a strange fire they brought in, and it was, no, 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 if there's any uh, at the, uh, the altar of incense and whatever, there is, it's taken, the fire is taken from the altar. Not a strange fire, so they just grabbed some wood from the, the, the house hearth or the, the campfire they, they had, and they took that and said, okay, we gotta, we're just going to go in with this. It, they were struck dead. The fire of God came out and, and, and struck them dead. It was, it's a terrible thing to just come and approach God. And I'll tell you right now, you say, well, is that happening today? There are people that, that come or would come into the presence of God and they come with things that they should not have going on in their life. As we see the day of the Lord approaching, listen, that we would get... We would desire to be in the house of the Lord, and even as we come, recognizing as we get things right, the offerings in the Old Testament, they were all about restoring relationship. And four of them had to do with sacrifice, animal sacrifice. There was a breaking of the body and, and the shedding of blood, all of it pointing to Jesus Christ, taking care of it. Because the heart of God is that we would have relationship with him, but he is a holy God. And to come into the holiest place, the holy of holies, to come into the presence of God, you just don't come in any way you want, but you come in in the beauty of holiness, and you come in only by his blood. It is by his blood that as we come into the house of the Lord, that we would come in by his blood. Lord, that there would be nothing. Lord, if there's things that I need to deal with, let me deal with those things. That I can come into your presence because you desire for me to enter in boldly and we can enter in boldly. That's why my faith is in the sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice. And I would encourage you that your faith would be in the ultimate sacrifice, Jesus Christ and him crucified. The burnt offering was about relationship. The peace offering was about relationship to have peace with God. The, the, the sin offering was about the things that would be between us and God that we don't even know. There was a sacrifice. Jesus, the sin offering, the things that I don't even know that I'm doing that are wrong. There's a sin offering. You are the sin offering for us. Or the things that the trespass offering, the things that I know that are wrong, I, I confess and there's a sacrifice that that lamb sacrificed even as I confess my sins. And then the priest takes and kills the lamb. And the blood is shed and the body broken. So that God is saying, because I want to have relationship with you. And so he's making a way. The final offering is the wave offering. Is, is just, it is a thing of, of free will. Lord, I want to give you praise. That there would be a praise that goes up to you as we come into the presence, his presence. You know what? I believe that the, one of the most beautiful things to the Lord, to the Father, it says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. One of the most pleasing things to God is that your faith is in Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross. That's sacrifice. That's where my faith is. And we can come in boldly. He desires that fellowship with us. And we come by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that veil that separated the people from from God, even the, the, the priests could not go through only once, once a year, one day of the year. We can come in boldly now, anytime. I don't understand why there would not be an assembling together. As the day of the Lord approaches, that we would not assemble together. 
or we would have no desire to assemble together. It says, especially as we see the day of, of the Lord approaching, that we would assemble together, that we would enjoy being in the presence of God, whether it's here at church or whether it's at Chuck, or Chuck's or Texas Chicken. Is that what? Churches. Churches. Thanks for the... Uh, for giving us that, uh, that lead there, Matt, and uh, getting us to, to uh, churches, Texas chicken. It was good. But there's a time of fellowship, to fellowship with each other, an assembling together of the saints. We, always, we, we think it's always in church, but it's outside of church too. It's outside of this place. The assembling together of the saints that we can come into his presence through the veil that is his flesh. His flesh that was broken, the veil was torn in two. His flesh was broken on the cross. A new and living way. Not like the Old Testament, not like the tabernacle, not like how it used to be. It's a new and living way that we can come in at any time. And we can come in boldly by his blood. Lord, I want to take time with you. And I want to take time with my brothers and sisters in the Lord to come into the house of God. It says in verse 21, Hebrews 10, 10, 21, it says, And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. No condemnation. I can come in boldly because my faith is in Jesus Christ and Him crucified. His body broken, His blood shed for me, and I can come in boldly. At any time, I say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for allowing me to come in and let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. This confession of our faith, of our hope, my hope is in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Some, love, some loving and good works. May I ask this? I just spoke with Ron Frisky this morning. I had mentioned uh, the other day, or to some, uh, the other last week when he was uh, in, or I went to see him, and, and I said, Ron, what, what, what's holding you back? Because he was saying, oh, you know what? They're asking me that I need to leave. I need to get out of the hospital. So I said, pray, praise God. They want him out. Thing is, he can't get to his place, can't even get in uh, without a lift at this point. I'm believing that, yeah, there's going to be some prosthetic or whatever that is able to be put on and so he'll be able to walk upstairs. But at this point, he can't. Long story short... I need some guys on Tuesday. I need some guys to give me a hand. I'm going to grab a trailer. We lined up a lift. The Lord was good. These lifts can cost like $10,000 new. To lift up from ground level up to the porch height, and then he can get into the house easily. So they're making an assessment on, on tomorrow about what, what are the things that he needs. One thing he needs is a lift or a ramp. He got a, a lift for free. And I say, praise God. So tomorrow, one of, the, one of the, his friends or one of his employees is going to go and take a look at it on Tuesday. I'm going to need some guys to help manhandle this thing into the, uh, the trailer. We'll bring it over to his place and, and uh, can get started on getting this thing in place. He needs to get out so he can begin to have his physio and occupational therapy and, and all of this to get this prosthesis put on and whatever. So I need some guys on Tuesday morning. So if you can see me after service or connect with me or call me or text me, whatever, just say, hey, Dave, I'm available uh, to help out on Tuesday. Um, we're trying to try to be, if you can, be a little bit flexible. I'm not exactly sure, but I'm, I'm hoping it'll be by 9 o'clock. Uh, I can have that trailer and we can be on our way to... Uh, to St. Catherine's where, where this thing is. Love and good works. Maybe it's 
VBS you saw when you came in there's all these this display and and so a number of you have signed up for vacation Bible school to help out last week of the of the month we need workers different workers see see Julie see Pastor Joel and uh, just let them know hey if you haven't already they've had some meetings already but it's not too late to 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 help out it's uh, from 9 till 12 uh, during that week and I, I recognize some of you are working maybe some of you are, are saying hey yeah I'm, I'm free in the mornings or I can help out or I'm not working whatever uh, let Julie know good works we're expecting to see that the kids that come that every single kid that comes here that doesn't know the Lord will know the Lord they will come to know Jesus as their Savior and you can have a part in that Perhaps it's uh, helping our, our youth. It's getting, yeah, it's expensive for, for youth to go and, and uh, for camp for a week. Uh, and that's happening in uh, August. If you want to help out uh, a, or towards sending some, Pastor Joel had uh, contact with a number of the parents. And so there's a number that are saying, we, yeah, we, We'd like to send them, but man, we don't have we don't have the money. So perhaps I know there's been some funds raised already. I think there's like five or six hundred dollars that has been raised, but that just takes care of if we if they spread it out, might only take care of uh, maybe fifty or eighty dollars off, depending on how many are going, their price. But if you want to help out with that, you can say, Hey, I want to help out with youth camp. Just market youth camp. And uh, it'll go towards that. And maybe some of you might be prompt to say, I, I want to do, maybe I can help out $400. I can help send one student for uh, one week because a number of those guys don't know the Lord. Those young ladies don't know the Lord. A lot of guys. There's a lot of guys coming out for, for youth on Wednesday nights. And many of them don't know the Lord. They need to know the Lord. So I, once again, we're talking about them helping or helping them come to a place of uh, salvation. The best work that we can do is see someone saved. Maybe it's using your talents. I make a little plug. Uh, I talked to John Raja this morning, and he was saying, hey, we've, we've, got, we've got some that have already grabbed, and they've sent, put in their applications. If you haven't, for David, David's Harp, which is a, a musical, not just a program, but it's a time for, for those with musical talents to, to gather together so that there could be eventually opportunity to exalt the Lord and to lift up the Lord in the house of the Lord or even outside of the house of the Lord. Uh, so to use your talents, uh, there's two dates already that are for July, and that's, uh, I think, the 15th. Uh, it's a Friday night and the 29th at 7 p.m. here at the church. Or you can, uh, if you're not going to grab the sheet, you can also, uh, I think, or grab the application on it. You can do it by email as well. So there's a, a you can email John and let him know that you're going to take part in this. So, um, and again, let me just say, to connect with unbelievers this summer and beyond, take time to connect the people that the Lord has put in your, your, your life, whether it's at work, relatives, neighbors, friends, co-workers, classmates, whoever it may be, Lord, let me connect. Let me share the gospel with them. Hallelujah. I'm going to just call the worship team if they'd come. The assembling of ourselves together. Right after service, we have a fellowship here. If you can stay and join us, join us. Uh, for a time of fellowship, food and fellowship. And uh, when it comes to assembling together, come. Whether it's Sunday morning you're here, whether it's Monday night with the men, Wednesday night, if you, you haven't caught the series, uh, catch it on YouTube, lighthouseniagara.com, the last number of, of weeks, the last few months. Uh, study on changing our future, which is has been going through the book of, of Romans, the letter to the Romans. And uh, Saturday morning, <clears throat> I know there's a number of young adults that gather together. Uh, 10, 10.30 here at the church, come. 
I, our times out, with the, whether it's the guys or with the women, come, let us uh, gather together. Maybe it's visiting somebody. Maybe it's somebody that's not been out to church for a while. Maybe it's going to the hospital. Uh, we want to pray for Alfred. We've been praying for Talasi on Friday. He was out biking. And um, I'll tell you, it seems like the enemy is, is attacking. Uh, his, his shoes were tied in, to his, in the straps. And so he had come to an intersection, had slowed down a bit. And he couldn't get his foot out. So he, he just went over on his side because he had come to stop in the light anyways. Long story short, he fell over on his side and he broke uh, something, at, I think, at the top of his hip or whatever. And it, so he's, he's out of it for six weeks. So we want to pray for, for Alfred. We want to pray for Ron. We want to pray for those that are are in the hospital or visit somebody that, or text or call um, people that you know that uh, aren't able to get out. Connect. Connect with the believer. Connect with the, the unbeliever. Invite them to your home. Can we stand together? I just want to give invitation. If there's anybody here or online and uh, you're recognizing that things are changing. I'll tell you, for the believer, the day of the Lord is, is going to be the most wonderful day we could ever imagine. For the unbeliever, it will be the worst day. It will be the worst day ever because what is coming after the, the catching up of the saints, you can read it in Revelations chapter 6 through 19. There's other books or chapters in, in the Bible that talk about the last days, Matthew 24 and 25, Jesus talks about it, Luke 21, Mark 13. These are Jesus speaking about the last days. Daniel speaks about it. Ezekiel speaks about it. So many of the prophets speak about different portions of what is coming. The day of the Lord, Joel speaks about it. The day of the Lord for us as believers will be the most wonderful day. But we want to we want to pray. And if there's anybody here, you're not right or you need to get ready. I just want to just pray a, a little prayer. Just of confession of where we are at or not at. And a placing of trust in Jesus Christ and inviting him into our lives. If we are that far distant from him or you feel distant to allow him to come into your life. So, Lord Jesus, uh, on behalf of those that might be here this morning that, man, they're not in the right place, and they know it. Lord, maybe there's some that are listening online. They know they're not in the right place, that if the trumpet should sound today and the day of the Lord would happen today, they would not be ready. And so, Lord, I just pray that there will be a confession of sin. Lord, if there's anything that needs to be repented of, that they would say, you know what, I confess this and I'm repenting of this. I'm not going to continue on in this. And Lord, I need your help that I don't continue on practicing these things that are, are, I know that are not right. And so, Lord, I just pray, let there be a repentance and a turning from sin and the practice of sin to a turning to you, that there would be a focus of our eyes on you. And Lord Jesus that there would be a confession of faith in your flesh that was broken, the veil that was torn in two so that we can come. Lord, because you went to the cross, because your body was broken for us, Lord, we can have access into the, to the presence of God boldly. And Lord, the sin that would keep us out before a holy God is washed clean. Even as we confess our sin, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we say thank you, Lord, for that this morning. We thank you, Lord, for your blood that washes us clean. Nothing else can wash us. And, Lord, even as we would heed your word to turn away and, and not only to not do the things that we, or things we shouldn't be doing, to, to not sin, but, Lord, to begin to, to do the things that we should. 
Lord, it's high time that we wake up at this point. The day, the light is shining. Lord, and we take on you. We put on you. Our faith, we declare our faith in you, and it covers every aspect of our being. Lord, our faith is in who you are and what you did for us on the cross 2,000 years ago. We put you on as armor, armor of light to dispel all the things of darkness and to move forward powerfully. Lord, provoking one another to love and to good works, assembling ourselves together as we see the day of the Lord approaching, exhorting one another, encouraging one another, lifting one another up. Lord, I pray these things as our faith is in you and as we receive you into our lives, we will do the things that you would have us do until the day of the Lord comes. In Jesus' name, Lord, I thank you in advance for those that will come to know you. Those that have come to know you just in the last little while. And Lord, those that still need to come to you, Lord, that it will be done. Lord, we'll have a part in it. And Lord, that they will have salvation. Lord, family members, friends, neighbors, Lord, our classmates, co-workers, Lord, the stranger. Lord, they will have salvation in and through you as we go out, Lord, as we go out to connect today, tomorrow, this week, next week, Lord, this month and so, in this summertime and beyond, Lord, we just pray until you come back, Lord, that we will do the work of harvest in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. After we're finished... Um, uh, I'm just going to say a quick prayer for our fellowship time and, and the food. And uh, if you can stay and join with us, it would be wonderful uh, that we can have this time of fellowship. And uh, so right after we finish singing, I'll say that prayer. And, and then God bless you. It was great having you here today. If you want to listen to more messages, you can click here or here. Also, check out our website, lighthouseniagara.com, for more information and podcasts and also to give. God bless you. Have a great day.